Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we'll discuss uh, approach to cranial nervous examination. Uh, one of the most uh, common scenarios in station five or uh, station three neurology case. This is a special acknowledgement to my uh, mentor and my teacher, Dr. Ahmed Meher Alewa. Uh, uh, our guidance for uh, passing uh, bases. Much thanks for his effort. Here, the cranial nerves are 12 cranial nerves. Okay, from 1 to 12. They are enumerated by this uh, pattern. Started by olfactory nerve, optic nerve, the third is oculomotor, fourth is trochlear, fifth is trigeminal, sixth is abducent, the seventh is facial, eighth is vestibular cochlear, and nine, glossopharyngeal, ten is vagus, and eleven is accessory. 12 is hypoglossal nerve. These are the 12 cranial nerves. Okay. These cranial nerves, some of them are carrying uh, motor function, some carrying sensory function, and some carrying both sensory and the motor, and some carrying are carrying sensory motor and uh, parasympathetic activity. Uh, if we see the olfactory nerve, it is for sm smelling sensation, the sensory nerve. Optic for the vision, the sensory. Oculomotor has motor in the movement of uh, eye uh, ball. Uh, we will find that all oculomotor extraocular muscles supplied by the third cranial nerve, except two. The SO4, superior oblique, supplied by the fourth. And the LR6, lateral rectus, supplied by the sixth cranial nerve, which is abducent. Okay. The trochal nerve also is all motor only. Trigeminal carrying a motor and sensory function. Abducent, as we mentioned before, is motor. The facial nerve has sensory and the motor and parasympathetic activity. The vestibular cochlear nerve for hearing and for uh, balance, it's carrying sensory function. Gross pharyngeal nerve is for sensory and the motor and the parasympathetic. Vagus is also the same motor and sensory and the parasympathetic. The accessory is motor only. And the hypoglossal is. <coughs> Cranial nervous examination, when you start, you need to do the following. Firstly, you, may, you, you need to do a hand sterilization and read the instruction. This instruction it will be a small paper above the patient. You have to read it very uh, carefully to know what exactly is requested from you to do for this patient. Then greeting for the examiners and the greeting for the patient. And uh, you have to introduce yourself. I am Dr. El Maghrabi, one of the doctors at the medical department today. Nice to meet you. Uh, and to confirm the patient identity if it's allowed or it's mentioned. Yani you know the name of the patient or the date of birth for him. Or, or if you don't know the name or the date of birth, you can say hello, how are you? Nice to meet you today, or good morning, good evening, like this. And then take a, a verbal consent that I'd like to examine the nerves of your head and the neck. Is it okay with you? Okay. Do you have any pain or discomfort? You will say no. Okay. If you have any pain or discomfort, please let me know. Then try to take a general survey for the surrounding observation to reach to a clues. If there is any uh, facial asymmetry, any toes, any walking aids, any special uh, decubitus of the patient, all this can carry a clue which will help you in your diagnosis and to reach your uh, final diagnosis. Then you can ask uh, directly about the uh, sense of smelling and taste and hearing. Do you have any problem in smelling? We'll go in this in depth after that, but that's uh, just a screening. Do you have any problem in your smelling? Any problem in your taste? Okay, any problem in your hearing? Can you hear me clearly? Okay. Then we'll start 
one nerve. The first one is our factor nerve, okay? As you mentioned, we will ask the patient directly. You have any problem in smelling? Okay. Uh, we can use this as yani, outside the scope of uh, clinical exam or basis. We can use different uh, special odors like uh, peppermint or coffee. It should be famous and irritant in the center. And uh, there is another uh, test can be used, which is called the University of Pennsylvania Smell Identification Test. Uh, <clears throat> It is uh, about uh, like curves, and in this curve, a specific uh, odors, and the doctor is scratching this by a specific technique and asks the patient exactly, do you, can you smell this? Can you smell this like this? And they can identify if the patient has any abnormal smell. Okay, the cause of anosmia uh, it's ranging from upper respiratory tract infection, simply or smoking, any nasal polyp, any trauma especially the base of the skull, uh, where there is a groove of the olfactory nerve, or any tumor affecting the area of the ethmoid bone, uh, like meningioma, like any olfactory groove abnormality. In elderly patient, congenital, especially the Kalman syndrome, uh, which is anosmia associated with hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, uh, or degenerative like Parkinson or Alzheimer with aging. After we finish the first cranial nerve, we can go to the second cranial nerves. Second and third and fourth and sixth. We can take it with each other by doing five maneuvers. We have to do the following, which is visual acuity, visual field, eye movement, eye reflexes, fundus examination. By this, we are checking the optic and the third and fourth and sixth cranial nerves, which is responsible for the extra ocular muscle. As uh, we mentioned before, that all, all the uh, extra ocular muscles supplied by uh, third cranial nerve, except the superior oblique, oblique muscle supplied by the fourth and lateral rectus supplied by sixth cranial nerve. Uh, when you are checking visual acuity, you ask the patient firstly, can you see all my face? Okay. Then, to be accurate, you need to check what is the Snellen chart. You will find this in the exam, Snellen chart, uh, and check it separately, each eye uh, separately, to check the visual acuity. acuity. Uh, and it should be uh, six meters away from the patient. Uh, if you cannot see, you can make it uh, three meters. Then near to the patient one meter. Then after that, making counting finger, how much, how many fingers you see, how many fingers you see, counting fingers. Then hand movement. Then lastly, perception of the light. You are checking this each each eye separately. Okay. Uh, then the visual field. The visual field. Uh, you are sitting in front of the patient and one arm lens. Ask the patient to cover one eye and he is covering the opposite eye, like a mirror image, and ask the patient to fix his neck and look to the center of your face to your nose. And after that, uh, you test each quadrant of the visual field separately, like uh, making any movement from your finger from outside to the inner side, from outside to the inner side, then from outside to inner side, outside to inner side, like you are moving on the uh, two o'clock, four o'clock, and ten o'clock, and eight o'clock. Repeat the same with the other eye, close the other eye, and also check the visual act from periphery to the center, from here, from here, then from here, from here. This is the visual field, comparing the visual field of the patient to your visual field, assuming that your field is normal. Then the third step is the eye movement. Eye movement is the H-shaped. H-shaped movement. You are check the patient if you have any pain or diplopia while I will move the, my, uh, my finger. Also the same fix. Let the patient fix his neck and look to you uh, in the center of your, uh, of your face. Then by your finger, uh, make the H-shaped movement. Start 
laterally like this, then go up, then go down, then go again, then think like this, like this, like this, like this. Come here with the patient, see above and see down. While you are moving this edge shape, try to come at the lateral edge and uh, wait for a while to see if there's any nystagmus in the eyes or not. Okay, so you are doing this edge shape like this, uh, like this, then the above, and also check for a while if the patient has fatigue in the eyelid. In the case of mycena gravis, you will feel fatigue in the other eyelid. Then down. This is called the edge shaped movement. Then after that, the eye reflexes. We have three reflexes, okay? The light reflex, accommodation reflex, cornea reflex. Light reflex, direct and consensual, which means direct and indirect. There is afferent and efferent. The afferent is by the second cranial nerve and efferent by the third cranial nerve, okay? After doing light reflex, you are doing swinging test. Swinging test, it means you are moving from one eye to other eye, okay? Uh, light reflex direct, you are checking the light in one eye and see the response of this eye, there is meiosis, and also this uh, action will be done in the other eye, will be meiosis of the other eye by indirect means. When you put the light in this eye, this constriction of this eye, and consequently there is constriction of the other eye, although the light is not reached to it. And also the same when you are doing the light reflex in the other eye, there is meiosis in this eye. And also consensually, this other eye will be constricted, although the light is not directly to it. This is the light reflex. Then accommodation reflex. Accommodation reflex asks the patient to look for a far distance and suddenly tell the patient, please look near some, some object like your finger or bend like this. Look the patient to make conversion or find the conversion of the movement. This is called accommodation reflex, which means after far vision, the eye can adapt to see the near object with the conversion of both eyes at the same time. The third reflex is the corner reflex, which is no need to be done in the exam, actually. Just you can mention it to the examiner, I'd like to do corner reflex, and you have to be aware that this is not uh, good to be done in exam because it's again it's the patient will fear. But kindly note that the afferent is the fifth cranial nerve and the efferent is the seventh cranial nerve. Okay, then lastly, the fundus examination. If uh, there is possible time and the case needed to check the retina and the checking the optic nerve, you have to offer this to the examiners, ask them, I'd like to check the fundus examination. There is a specific technique for fundus examination, and uh, we can make it in another lecture regarding how to use the ophthalmoscope and how to identify lesions in the optic nerve and in the retina. Just for your knowledge, uh, the causes of meiosis and mydriasis rapidly. Yeah. Uh, cause of meiosis, if we are using uh, meiotic eye drops, make constriction like bilocarbine, or we are using mydriatic eye drops, which is usually used in the exam for dilatation of the pupils so that allow you to check the fundus examination. There is uh, argyle droplets in pupil, which is having in syphilis, Horner syndrome, which is consists of ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, and enophthalmos. Bontine hemorrhage, one of the most common cause of meiosis. Some drugs, especially the opiates, morphine, which are given to patients with uh, severe pain, like sickle cell, like this. Organophosphorus poisoning, uh, which is uh, treated, by the way, by the atropine. So we find here the atropine is one of the causes of mydoriasis. Also, iritis, make irritation of the pupil and meiosis, or the extreme of age, as in infancy or in advanced age. Regarding cause of mydriasis, the mydriatic eye drops, as we mentioned before, the holmes edil meiotic pupil, which can be having in young female, uh, it's a meiotic pupil, atonic, dilated, sometimes associated with uh, a reflexia. It is a normal variant and uh, no need, not needed for any intervention or treatment. Third, the cranial nerve palsy is doing meiosis. Here, just to know, 
uh, Horner doing meiosis, but third cranial nerve is mitosis, and both will produce ptosis. So if you have ptosis in the eye, one eye with ptosis, better to elevate the eyelid to check the pupil. If the pupil is meiosis, so it is Horner, ptosis, meiosis, anhydrosis, enophthalmos. And you can know the lesion of the Horner by ask about the uh, anhydrosis. It can discriminate what is the, where is the lesion. Is it uh, preganglionic or central or postganglionic, as we will mention later. Uh, but in the third cranial nerve palsy, there will be ptosis of the eye and the pupil will be mitosis. Some other causes like uh, atropine, antihistamine, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and the patient with deep coma or death or in case of trauma. Regarding the visual field, just a simple uh, diagram. We have one eye, the other eye, right eye, left eye. The retina, this is the nasal part, this is the temporal part. Here is the nasal part, here is the temporal part. For the visual field, the retina of the temporal part is responsible for the vision of this nasal part. And the vice versa, the retina at the nasal part is responsible for the vision of the temporal part. Also in the other ear, in the other eye, sorry, the retinal cells ear is responsible for the vision of the nasal part, and the retinal cells in the nasal part responsible for the vision of the temporal field. Then we'll find there is crossing here. After the retina, there is the optic nerve, and this is the optic chiasm. Optic nerve, optic nerve, then the, they make decussation here in the optic chiasma. You will find that the nasal from one side and the nasal from the other side, they are decussating, but the temporal from each side is running in the same side. So here is a temporal part is going here, temporal part is going here, but the nasal part here is crossed to the other side, and the nasal part here is crossed to the other side, forming what's called optic tract. So this is retina, optic nerve, optic chiasma, optic tract. So one optic tract is responsible for this part of the retina, and this part of the retina, which is responsible for the vision here, and the vision here. This vision and this is one of this vision. So if there is any lesion in the optic tract here in one side, it means the hemianobia will be in the opposite sides, as we will see in the next uh, diagram. Then optic nerve, optic uh, chiasma, then the optic tract, then the lateral geniculate body. After this lateral geniculate body, this optic radiation. Optic radiation is consists of uh, some fibers running in the temporal loop and some in the parietal loop. Okay, then ending to the visual field, which is responsible for the perception of the vision and seeing the objects. Okay. So remember, uh, this diagram is very important so that we can know what will be happening if we make a lesion in a specific part of the okay. type. Here, as we mentioned before, we will see now how what uh, about uh, affection of some uh, parts in the visual pathway and what is the impact of the visual field in this after this affection. Okay. Uh, firstly, if we affect uh, one of the optic nerve, so we we'll damage this eye completely. So this eye will be lost. So no vision. This is the lesion in the optic nerve. 
in the optic chiasma if the lesion coming in the nasal part it will be different if the or different uh, between the nasal part or the lesion coming in the temporal part any lesion affecting the central part here it will affect the decussation so it will affect the vision in the both here and here in the both lateral part which, which will induce what's called bitemporal hemianopia because you have you will make a lesion in the center here which is carrying the nasal fiber here from the nasal fiber here and both this nasal fiber and this nasal fiber responsible for the vision from the outer side here and from the outer side here so you, you will lose the temporal field in both eyes which is called bitemporal hemianopia this lesion is most commonly seen in pituitary adenoma and craniopharyngioma. Craniopharyngioma and pituitary adenoma. Pituitary adenoma including either hyperprolactinemia or gross hormone like in case of acromegaly. So this is very important by temporal hemianopia. Okay. Uh, but uh, if the lesion is coming here in the optic chasm, but mainly from at the outer part, so it only affects this temporal retina which is responsible for the nasal uh, part of the vision so the lesion will be as this the same eye affection and the nasal part of the vision will be lost okay this is number three number four here this lesion in the optic tract as i mentioned before in optic tract you have mix you have now fibers which is coming from this part which is a temporal retina of one eye and the uh, nasal retina of the other part. So nasal retina here and temporal retina here. So both fields in one direction, which is opposite to the direction of the affected optic tract, which is called homonymous hemianopia. This is called homonymous hemianopia. Okay. But regarding if the lesion come to the optic radiation, as you mentioned, optic radiation, there is uh, fibers running in the temporal loop and fibers running in the parietal loop. It will uh, result in same like homonymous hemianopia, but instead of it is uh, uh, like this, it will be quadrantable. So it's called quadrantable hemianopia. Either lower quadrantable hemianopia like this, or upper quadrantable hemianopia. Okay. Uh, to not be confused by this, there is a very famous uh, mnemonic, which is called TIPS, which means that if the temporal fiber is affected, the inferior field is will be lost. So it make like this: inferior hemi, inferior quadrantable hemianopia. If the parietal fibers is the one affected, so it result in superior quadrantable hemianopia. So T I B S tips. Temporal, inferior, parietal, superior. Okay. So this is regarding five and six, which is lesion here in the optic radiation. So we have to remember this. Number one is the optic nerve. Number two, by temporal hemianopia, which is a fiction in the center of the optic chiasma. And uh, if there is a fiction the lateral part it will be uh, contralateral hemianopia and this part which is called homonymous hemianopia which means lesion in the optic tract and superior quadrantable hemianopia or inferior quadrantable hemianopia in the lesion of the optic radiation i hope it will be clear and easy for you now so just to revise with you by temporal hemianopia it means the patient cannot see the outer parts of the eyes. So in case of pituitary adenoma, as we mentioned, in acromegaly or hyperglactinemia, and in case of craniopharyngeal, the patient suffer from ego pumping objects. He can make accident by car, especially in the post lateral sides. Regarding homonymous hemianopia, it means one side of the eye cannot see. He cannot see like this or cannot see like this. The visual field here and here, or the visual field here and here. It's called homonymous hemorrhage, either right or left. And it is in the contralateral affection of the optic uh, 
tract. Optic tract left, so has right homonymous hemorrhage. Optic tract right, so there is left homonymous hemorrhage. The causes is like vascular trauma, tumor, MS, scolitis, any cause can do like this. This is what's called relative afferent pupillary defect. While we are going the swinging light movement, we will find what's called the relative afferent pupillary defect. And the other name is called Marcus Gunn-Bugge. It means that when you put the light in one eye, should be constriction, and the other eye consequently will be constricted. This is light reflex direct, and this is indirect light reflex. Okay. In Marcus gunn pupillary in Marcus gunn pupil or relative afferent pupillary defect, there is a problem in the afferent, in the optic nerve, in the form of the optic nerve, uh, optic neuritis, or large retinal detachment. When you put the light in the eye, there is no myosis. It will be mydriasis, not responding to the uh, light and there is constriction. It will be dilatation of the eye. So there is intact, direct, and the consensual reflex in both eyes. When the eyes are tested separately. But during swinging torch test, you will find, for example, the left eye will be dilate, while the right eye will de demonstrate sustained constriction from the previous light exposure. So this is called abnormal left pupillary dilatation, when the light is directed to this left eye. So it's called left eye relative afferent pupillary defect. I will let you see a video in the next slides to for more demonstration regarding this relative afferent pupillary defect. In this case, you have to check the visual acuity in this eye because there is maybe optic uh, atrophy or optic neuritis or large retinal attachment, and you have to check the fundus to see if there is any optic nerve or retinal affection, like the central retinal artery occlusion or retinal vein occlusion. By the way, there is nothing called bilateral relative afferent, relative afferent pupillary defect. There is no bilateral relative afferent pupillary defect. For the causes of relative afferent pupillary defect, as we mentioned before, either optic nerve causes or retinal causes. The optic nerve, optic atrophy, optic neuritis, the retinal cause, central retinal artery occlusion, central retinal vein occlusion, severe ischemic diabetic retinopathy, severe macular degeneration, large retinal detachment, retinal infection, the form of cytomegalovirus or herpes simplex virus, and tumors in the retina or choroidal like melanoma or retinal elastoma. Other causes can may induce this relative afferent pupillary thing, like frontal brain tumor, which is called Foster Kennedy syndrome. Foster Kennedy syndrome, there is a tumor making direct obstruction uh, on one optic nerve, so this optic nerve will have optic atrophy. While the other optic nerve, you will find manifestation of increased intracranial pressure because this is a tumor. So there's a tumor making increased intracranial pressure, but the tumor is compressing for one eye, making optic atrophy on one eye, and the other eye, you will see uh, optic uh, babyledema. So one optic nerve show optic atrophy, the other optic nerve show babyledema. Other causes like cerebellar signs in uh, multiple sclerosis, internuclear thermoplasia, or Friedrich's ataxia, also Baget disease and syphilis. This is a video for relative afferent pupillary defect. As you see. Mm. 
Here, this is uh, examples that you, if you see one patient like this. This is three stages. The patient now looking straight to you in the image A. In the image B, the patient look to the right side. Image C, the, the patient is looking to the left side. So what do you think about the abnormality in this patient? As you see, this, the patient is looking in front of you now, okay? This eye is looking to you, this eye is not looking, it's deviated. Okay. Now the patient asked to look to the right side, this eye moved to the right side by the lateral rectus of the right eye, so it's intact, lateral rectus in the right eye. But here, the eye is not moved, this eye should move to this direction. So when this patient look to the right side, right eye move to the right side by the right lateral rectus, and the left eye move to the right side here by the third cranial nerve, because this is medial rectus supplied by the third cranial nerve. So let me write like this. Like, uh, so this is would move by the lateral rectus, which is supplied by the six cranial nerve. So it makes this eye move to this direction. And the other eye, this left eye, to move to this direction. So here is the medial rectus, which should be work, and to go pull the eye to this direction, which is supplied by the third cranial nerve. So it seems there is a problem in this direction. The last photo, this patient look to the right side. So this eye move like this. This is done by the medial rectus of the right eye, supplied by the third cranial nerve. And here, this eye go to that direction by the lateral rectus, which will be supplied by the sixth cranial nerve, which is here, is intact. So it seems that the abnormality is in this part. So the third cranial nerve is affected. So this patient has left third cranial nerve pulse. I hope it is clear. Let's see another example. This gentleman is in the first eye, is look to you. Then in the second slide, you asked him to the, uh, go to the right side, move his eye to the right side. He moved this eye to the right side and this eye to the other side. Then asked him to look to the left. By this eye, look to the left. And this eye should look to the left. The same as we mentioned, 
this eye to look to this direction, so it uh, worked by the lateral rectus of the right eye, supplied by the six, is intact, and this eye to go to this direction should work by the medial rectus of the left eye, which is supplied by the third cranial nerve. Here also is intact. When the patient is asked to look to the left side, so this eye will move to that direction, which is carried by the medial rectus of the right eye, which is supplied by the third cranial nerve. And this eye should move like this by the action of the lateral rectus muscle, which is that supplied by the sixth cranial nerve. It seems that the problem is in this area. So this patient has left six cranial nerve bots. I hope it is clear. Now let's go to the third cranial nerve bolts. As we mentioned before, third cranial nerve bolts will result in ptosis and dilated pupil. Here the ptosis will be complete because the third ptosis it means the right uh, it means the upper lid is dropped. The upper lid there is supplied by two by third cranial nerve and by sympathetic chain. So both of sympathetic chain and Third cranial nerve is needed to maintain the upper eyelid is moving up. So if the third cranial nerve affection, there is ptosis. If the sympathetic change affection, as in Horner's syndrome, there is ptosis. But the ptosis will be completely in the third cranial nerve. But in Horner's syndrome, which is affection of sympathetic change, the ptosis will be partial ptosis. So third cranial nerve palsy lead to complete ptosis. Sympathetic chain affection in the Horner syndrome will lead to partial ptosis. So, so the kind of there is ptosis and uh, dilated pupil. The pupil will be migrated, as I mentioned to you before. There is a difference between Horner syndrome and the kind of. So this is complete ptosis, this is partial ptosis, and this is will be with dilated pupil and Horner syndrome will be meiosis constricted pupil. Then you will find in the third cranial nerve that the eye is pointed down and out. Down and out because there is the super uh, added or the unopposed action of the other two cranial uh, six cranial nerve by the lateral rectus six and super oblique four. Super oblique is making the eye go down and uh, inside, uh, uh, inside and, uh, and down like you are reading a book or going down the stairs. This is actually the superior oblique muscle which is supplied by the fourth cranial nerve. So it would be taking a high power uh, and the lateral rectus to uh, outside. So the action of lateral rectus and superior oblique will be more dominant than the action of the third cranial nerve. Here, very important that we have to check the pupil because there is medical causes of third cranial nerve palsy and the surgical causes of third cranial nerve palsy. Kindly note that if the, it is a medical cause, the eye will be normal, pupil will be normal. But in surgical cause, the eye will be, uh, the pupil will be dilated. Uh, because in the surgical cause, it's mainly by the compression or obstruction, compression from outside, and the uh, fibers carrying the uh, papillary fibers is running in the outer side of the, uh, of the, uh, of the nerve, it will be easily uh, affected. One second. This is the third cranial nerve. As I mentioned to you, the trochlear nerve, which is supplying the fourth cranial nerve, making the eye look to nasally and in tort, like you are rotating near the nose, in case of reading a book or going uh, down the stairs. What about the causes of the third cranial nerve palsy? Uh, if it is medical causes or surgical causes, we can summarize it by this uh, table. 
medical causes of cervical cranial palsy for m monomorphous multiplex like diabetes or midbrain infarction like in weber uh, syndrome and midbrain demyelination like ms and in case of migraine monomorphous multiplex most common cause like diabetes and other cause of vasculitis midbrain infarction is weber syndrome or weber syndrome weber syndrome mean that there is affection in the midbrain as we know there is a uh, Midbrain, bones, medulla. Midbrain, bones, medulla. The midbrain, there is a third and fourth cranial nerve. And in the bones, there is fifth and sixth and seven and eighth cranial nerve. In the medulla, there is nine, the nucleus of the nine. And 10 and 11 and 12. Weber syndrome means affection of the third cranial nerve and in one side and hemiplegia of the other side. So one patient has third cranial nerve in one side of the body and hemiplegia of in the opposite side. This is called Caused hemiplegia. It means cranial nerve affection in one side of the body and the hemiplegia in the other side of the body. So, third the cranial nerve affection in one side and the hemiplegia on the other side. This is called the midbrain infarction weather syndrome. And midbrain demyelination, most common cause is MS and migraine. Regarding the, regarding the surgical causes like uh, communicating artery aneurysm, cavernous sinus uh, thrombosis, or uh, cerebral uncus hernia, this is a surgical cause. Let us see a video illustrating the third cranial nerve also. The most sweat is a video will be not uh, common scary. Yes, the video will start now. Third cranial nerve pulse. Right eye. So as we mentioned, in third cranial nerve pulse, there is complete tosis. We have to elevate the lid to check the pupil. Is it meiosis or mitosis? Tosis, meiosis, and hydrosis in the matching with Horner, or if tosis and mitosis mostly will be third cranial nerve pulse. Uh, and you check the movement of the eye. You will be the upper hand with the lateral rectus, elevated the eye to the left, to the outer side, or the superior oblique making the eyeball move to the down and inside. This is another 
video illustrating what's called uh, bilateral internuclear salmoplegia. The most common cause of this is uh, MS, multiple sclerosis, bilateral internuclear salmoplegia. Uh, to simplify this, I will run the video now, but I'd like to you to know, as you mentioned before, if the eye go to this side, so lateral rectus of this and the medial rectus of this muscle, okay? And if they ask this patient to look to this side, so lateral rectus of this side and the medial rectus of this side, okay? This is number one. Number two, as you see, when the direction of both eyes coming to one side, so like the eye will be directed to the left side. So there is uh, lateral rectus of this side and the medial rectus of this side. The lateral rectus here by the sixth cranial nerve, and the medial rectus here by the third cranial nerve. There is a connection between the third cranial nerve here and sixth cranial nerve here, and it's connected to what's called in the medial longitudinal uh, fasciculus. This medial longitudinal fasciculus is responsible for the conjugate eye movement. Me lead the eye moving to the same direction like this to the right side or go to the left side so it may yes. with both uh, with both eyes hello hello yes. okay سامعني ايوه عشان معاك بقول لك انا بس هقوم اشوف حاله وارجع انت كمله وخلي خلي الريكوردنج شغال طيب وانا هقوم وارجع لك طيب اوكي اوكي خلاص مش مشكله لما ترجع بقول طيب سو so, شغال وانا هرجع اكمله خلاص اوكي لما ترجع بقى اعرف نفس عشان ابعت لك طيب ذا موفمنت اوف ذا اي از اي منشن تو يو نو سو اف ذا اي ويل جو لايك ذس اي نيد تو جو ذس اي جو ذات سايد ذس اي تو جو ذس سو اي كان موف هير اور اي ونت تو لوك تو ذا اذر سايد My eye will move like this. There's conjugate eye movement to this side, conjugate eye movement to this side. If I can move one eye and the other eye will not move, okay, like this. If if you asked me to look to the, uh, say, to my, my right side, as you see me now. So this eye can move like this, but this eye not move. Should move like this, but this is not movement. So look look here. So I move like this, but this not move. This eye move, it will suffer from nystagmus. Okay. It will suffer from that. And the other eye not move fixed here. Okay. On the other side, if I move to here and this eye move like this, and this eye not move, the eye moved it will make nystagmus. Okay. And the Uh, other eye which is failed to move it will be in the same place. Okay. So internuclear of cellmoplegia, it means uh, there is abduction. When we say to outside, called abduction, abduction of one eye and the stigmas of this abducted eye and the failure of adduction of the other. This eye moves this from here to nose, it's called adduction. So failure of adduction of this. Eye and abduction of this eye associated with nystagmus. So nystagmus in the abducted eye and the failure of abduction of the other eye. This means that there is a problem in the medial longitudinal fasciculus in this side, which is the same side of the uh, failed failed abducted eye. Okay. Again, if I make it in the opposite side, we make it like this. You ask me to look to this side, okay? So this eye move like this, and the make nystagmus, and this eye will not move. So the abducted abducted eye has nystagmus, and this failure of adduction of the other eye, and in this side of failure of adduction of this eye, this is the lesion in the medial longitudinal fasciculus, okay? I hope it will be clear and this video will illustrate more. Let's see.
this I move with nystagmus. This move with nystagmus, and this is not move. This I move with nystagmus, and this I not move. I will repeat again so that you can notice. When the patient moves to one side, like this, in this direction, this I go like this, and this is nystagmus, while the other I not move. This is failure of abduction of this eye, and so the medial nocturnal fasciculus in this part. When the other direction to this part, ask the patient to look to this uh, finger. So this eye move here with nystagmus, but the other eye here is fixed, not move. So the lesion will be here in the medial nocturnal fasciculus. So here lesion and here lesion, this is called bilateral uh, medial nocturnal fasciculus lesion. So it's called internuclear of cell mobilization. The most common cause is MS. Let's repeat the video again and try to notice it clearly. This I move, this not move. This move, not move. The other side, this move, this nystagmus, and this fix it, not move. Okay. Let's finish now. We, we finish the second, third, fourth, six craniums. So, second, third, fourth, six cranium. Let's go to the fifth, which is missed here. We'll put him separate. The fifth cranial nerve, which is the trigeminal nerve. Okay. Uh, for trigeminal nerve, as you see, trigeminal has three parts uh, or three functions sensory function, motor function, and reflexes. Regarding the sensation, we will speak about sensation and the motor and reflex. Sensation. Sensation is uh, you have to check the bicotton and pin break. So you are checking the touch and the uh, pain and temperature. Uh, how to do the sensory, uh, to check the sensory affection of the face. Firstly, trigeminal is responsible for the uh, sensation of the face. Sensation of the face is by trigeminal, and the motor of the face, the muscle of the face, is by the facial nerve. So, muscle of the face, movement of muscle of the face is by facial nerve, but the sensation of the face is by trigeminal nerve. So, ask the patient to check the sensation in each of the uh, salmic branch, maxillary branch, mandibular branch. Also, salmic, maxillary, mandibular. So, salmic and maxillary and mandibular. We are checking the sensation here and here, here and here, here and here, and to compare the same size, here, the same side, here and here and here are the same or no, here and here and here are the same or no, and keeping in the consideration, compare the sensation of the face with the sensation of the uh, outside the face. So checking the sensation here in the mastoid process to know if this sensation loss is only trigeminal or it's a part of semi, uh, hemi, it's called hemisensory loss. So uh, ask the patient to close his eye and check sensation here. What do you hear? Is this cotton? Yes, you feel cotton here. Okay, do you feel cotton here? Is the same size, same intensity? Yes, cotton here, cotton here. Yes, cotton here, cotton here. Yes, here, 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 like same others. Yes, here, 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 like same other. Yes, is it like here? Is it like here? Is it like here? So compare it with the reference. Yes, it's like here, like here, like here. Yes, and repeat it by the pen brick. In pen brick, in exam, better to not use a sharp needle. You can use a blunted. Uh, a blunted, it's called a neurotip. It's uh, blunted, so to uh, yeah, maintain the patient will fail because it will be a very sensitive area while examining the pain break in the face. And repeat the same. You feel here, like here, here, like here, here, like here, okay, here, like here, like here, yes, here, like here, like, like here, yes. And compare with the mastoid, is the same or no? Compare to the mastoid, is the same or no? Okay. Right. Regarding the motor function, <clears throat> the motor we have the three muscles which are called 
temporalis muscle and the masseter muscle, which is the strongest muscle in the body, is so for the mastication. This is temporalis muscle. This is masseter muscle, and this is the pterygoid muscle, is also for the closure of the mouth. So if you ask the patient to clench his teeth and to feel the strength of the muscle here, clench your teeth and feel the temporalis muscle here, then clench the teeth and feel the uh, masseter muscle border like this, and the pterygoid asks the patient to open his mouth against resistance, and you put your hand like this to resist against him to open his mouth. Okay, then going to the reflexes, we have <clears throat> two reflexes the jaw reflex and the cornea reflex. The jaw reflex is carried by afferent and different by the fifth cranial. You are putting your finger like this and tap by the hammer. Normally, there is no response or mild closure of the mouth is accepted. But if the patient has press closure of the mouth like this, you do like this and he close his mouth brisk abruptly. This indicates there is bilateral pyramidal tract lesions, there is upper motor near the above the bones, which is called pseudo palpa pulse. The other reflex is the cornea reflex, that you touch the cornea by a cotton. As I mentioned, there will be blinking, and this reflex is not recommended to be done in the exam because it's against the patient to fail. Cornea reflex is carried by the fifth, this is the uh, afferent, and the afferent is closure of the eye, so by the orbicularis uh, oculi, by the seventh cranial nerve. So this is a function of the train trigeminal sensory, through the ophthalmic and mandibular branches, compare it with the sensation in the mastoid by C2. If C2 is affected, it means there is hemisensory loss, and this is a upper motor neural region, at the level of the internal capsule and above, and if it's normal, so it's only trigeminal nerve affliction. Regarding the motor, we're checking the three muscles, temporalis, masseter, and pterygoid muscle, as we mentioned, and the reflexes, we have two reflexes, the jaw reflex and the corneal reflex, which is not recommended to be done. This photo illustrates for you, this is the salmon, this is the area of maxillary, this is the area of mandibular, and this is the sensation, this is the motor, this is the reflex. In the sensation, we check by the cotton, then by the neurotip, as I mentioned, the cotton in the here and here, here and here, here and here, and to compare one side and to compare the other side, and to compare each side in relation to the reference point in the mastoid process, and also repeat this with the reference point of the mastoid process. This is by the cotton. And by the pain prick, neurotip, we are checking also with the same in the ophthalmic maxillary mandibular here, ophthalmic maxillary mandibular here, is all the same or no? And is it like each other or no? And to compare each side with the reference point of the mustard, same like what we did in cotton sensation. Then the motor, the three muscles. This is the masseter, clench the teeth and check the masseter by the two hands. And check the, sorry, this is the temporalis, checking the temporalis by, the, by your both hands. Then checking the masseter and touch the muscle border by your hand. Then the pterygoid, put your hand like this and did not uh, let the patient open and make him open against this and to shake the bar of the trigoid muscle. And finally, the reflexes. This is the jaw reflex. Tab on your finger. Okay. And this is a corneal reflex. As we mentioned, the jaw reflex afferent and different 5 5, and the corneal reflex afferent and different is 5 7. And this is not done in the exam. Now we will come to the facial nerve. Facial nerve is carry also the sensory, motor, and reflexes. So what is the sensation of the facial nerve? What is the sensation function of the facial nerve? The facial nerve, carry, carry, the facial nerve is carrying a sensory function in the form of it's responsible. It, it is responsible for the taste at the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. So the taste sensation, anterior two-thirds of the tongue, by the facial nerve. Posterior one third of the tongue by the glossopharyngeal nerve. So, sensation number one, taste of the anterior two thirds of the tongue. Number two, uh, if there is paralysis of the facial nerve, there is hyperacosis because there is paralysis of the strabidius, strabidius muscle inside the, the ear. So, the sens sensation of the hearing will be loud. You would see 
you will he hear the voices are louder if the fish and nerve is affected. So this is the two sensation carried by the fish and nerve. Taste anterior to set of the tongue and the hearing regarding if paralysis of the stapedius muscles, there is uh, hyperacusis. The motor, uh, you can check the motor uh, power in the face by two actions in the upper part of the face and the two actions in the lower part of the face. The upper part of the face simply asks the patient to raise his, the eyebrow and you will see the wrinkles and try to resist. Uh, uh, <coughs> this is number one, is the eyebrow. Number two, ask the patient to close his eye firmly and you will try gently to open the eye and to see if he can resist opening of the eye or not. If there is facial uh, bolts, you will find uh, the wrinkle in one, uh, in one side and no wrinkle in the other side. So it means there is facial uh, loss. And if the patient closes his eye, it will be firmly in this side and the wrinkle in this side. And this affected side, no wrinkle here. And you can easily open his, his eye. In the lower part of the face, you can check the angle of the mouth by asking the patient to smile. Ask him, please smile or show me your teeth. So he will smile, and you will see the nasolabial fold, and you will see the angle of the mouth deviated equally. If there is a friction in one side of the face, so the angle of the mouth will be deviated to one side like this, and this side will be flat, and nasolabial fold will be flat. Okay. So, and also you are asking the patient to blow, blow out the cheek like this, and you try to do deflate the, the cheeks. In case of intact so we cannot do anything in this side but if this is uh, facial nerve affection so the muscle here is will be weak so if you make like this deflation the air will be coming outside so it will be loss of wrinkle here you can able open the, the eye gently while the patient try to close firmly and show your teeth the mouth will be move like this and here no and the wing make blow out to be easily deflated in this side. It means there is a facial affection in this side. What about the reflexes carried by the facial nerve? We have two reflexes, glabellar reflex and the corneal reflex. Glabellar reflex, which is not recommended to be done in the exam. And we will mention this glabellar reflex when we speak about Parkinson uh, disease and the examination in the Parkinson patient. Glabellar reflex means like you're making tabbing here in the forehead of the patient, tabbing. Tabbing like this, without putting your hand in front of you, blowing like this, so he cannot see you doing like this. Normally, normally this blinking for for a while, and the normal person will stop blinking. But in Parkinson uh, disease, he will complete blinking, continue blinking, continue blinking, continue like this. It's called the glabellar reflex. It's not recommended. But you have to know the afferent and efferent is by fifth, uh, seventh cranial nerve. Afferent and efferent is by seventh cranial nerve. And I'd like to remind you again by corneal reflex mentioned before in the trigeminal nerve. You have to mention here also because the afferent by trigeminal and efferent closure of the eye is by the facial nerve. So this is the function of the facial nerve. Three, sensory, motor, and reflexes. Sensory, anterior to third of the tongue, hyperacousis of paralysis of the stapedius. Motor. Upper face to action, raise the eye and close the, raise the eyebrow and close the eyes. Lower face to action, show me your teeth and blow out your cheeks. The liberal has the liberal effects and corneal effects. This is an image. Here asking the patient the two action in the upper part of the face, raise the eyebrow and see the wrinkles and the try by your hand make it down. And the other action in the upper part of the face, ask the patient to close his eye and firmly and you trying gently. To open, you will be easy to open here, but cannot open the other normal side. And the lower part of the face uh, to action, show me your teeth like this, check the nasal liver fold and the angle of the mouth, and after that, ask to blow cheek and try to deflate. Uh, I remember you to remind you about the ice cream uh, amazing test is carrying by the facial nerve, okay, by the nerve which is called. called uh, Corbettin Bani. Corbettin Bani, a branch of the facial nerve responsible for the taste of anterior to of the tongue. We will come now to a most important uh, item in the facial nerve, which is the facial nerve palsy. Is it upper motor neuron lesion or lower motor neuron lesion? 
let's uh, tell you something before starting this. Uh, as I mentioned to you, the, this is the brain stem, midbrain, bones, middle. The seven cranial nerve is here. We have seven cranial nerve here on the right side and seven cranial nerve nucleus on the left side. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and this is a midline like this. Okay. And this is a hemisphere on the left side. This is hemisphere on the right side. Uh, let us put a fixed uh, rule that if a tract coming from here, going to the nucleus of the facial nerve like this okay and reaching to the nucleus of the facial nerve and then after that coming from the nucleus itself go to the uh, muscle of the face. Here in the face. Any lesion start from the cortex of the brain till the nucleus. This is called the upper motor neuron. But the nucleus itself down to the muscle, this is called lower motor neuron. So if you have lesion here in the cortex or in this tract, which is called the corticobulbar tract, any lesion here is called upper motor neuron lesion. So it means any lesion starting from the cortex till the nucleus. But lesion starting from the nucleus itself down till reaching the muscle, so this is called lower motor neuron lesion. I hope this will be clear because it's very important to know what's meant by upper motor neural lesion and what's meant by lower motor neural lesion. The nucleus is a, uh, is a, is a, is a cutoff point. Nucleus or down, and downward in lesion from the nucleus. Downward is called lower motor neural lesion. So lesion from the nucleus, from the nerve itself, from the muscle, neuromuscular junction, till the nerve, till the muscle. This is muscle affection. So muscle affection, nerve affection. Neuromuscular junction affection. The nerve itself, the nucleus itself, all this called any affection in this tract is called lower motor neuron lesion. But any affection starts from the cortex and the cortico bulbar tract, this is called upper motor neuron lesion. Okay. Let me erase this. Okay. So this is a demonstration, simple demonstration, as you see. Uh, this is the face, this is the upper part of the face, and this is the lower part of the face. Okay, this is the brain stem, midbrain, bones, medulla. As we mentioned before, the facial nerve located in the bones. We increase the bones to make illustration. And this is the facial nucleus on the right side, this is the facial nucleus on the left side. Okay, and this is the brain and the cortex in one side and the brain cortex in the other side. Each facial uh, nucleus, right facial nucleus, left facial nucleus, it is divided into two parts, right and upper, uh, upper and lower, okay, upper and lower. The upper part of the facial nucleus is responsible for the upper part of the face, while the lower part of the facial nucleus is responsible for the lower part of the face on the same side. The other side, also the upper part of the facial nucleus, is responsible for the upper part of this face. And the lower part of the facial nucleus on the left side is responsible for the lower part of the face in the side. Okay. Let's tell another information that the lower part of the face, uh, sorry, lower part of the facial nucleus is responsible for the lower part of the face. Upper part of the facial nucleus is responsible for the upper part of the face. And we need to know that the upper part of the facial nucleus is supplied by lateral, supplied by lateral from the uh, brain on, on both sides, so it's supplied from same side, ipsilateral side, and from the contralateral side. But the lower half of the facial nucleus is only supplied by the contralateral hemisphere. 
is very important information. Okay, so each facial nucleus, the upper part of the facial nucleus, is bilaterally supplied from the cerebral cortex, while the lower part of the facial nucleus is contralaterally supplied by the cerebral cortex. So it means the upper part of the facial nucleus is has two supply, so it is more uh, innervated than the uh, lower part. Let us see now what will happen if we make a lesion. Suppose I will make a lesion in this area. This means that we are above the nucleus, so, right? Above the nucleus, it means upper motor neuron lesion. So the face will be affected. This part, this lesion means affection of the upper part of the nucleus and also affection of the lower part of the nucleus. So the upper part of the face and the lower part of the face. So it should be upper part of the face and the lower part of the face in this, in this side will be affected. But we'll find that the upper part is spared. Why? Because this uh, upper part is supplied by the upper part of the nucleus and this upper part is, has two supply. We have lesion here, but we don't have lesion here. So still the upper part of the nucleus is intact, so still the upper part of the face is intact. So this is called right upper motor neuron lesion of the face, of the facial nerve. It's called right facial upper motor neuron lesion, okay? Which is like this. The half of the face, the lower part of the half of the face is the contralateral side of the affection, the upper motor neuron lesion. So upper motor neuron lesion the left side, the affected face in the right side, but in the lower quadrant of the right side. The upper quadrant is spared because the upper part of the facial nucleus is spared because it has double supply from the cerebral cortex. On the contrary, the other lesion, if we make lesion here, this lesion, we can say from the nucleus itself, down the facial nerve, the muscle, barotid, reaching the face, cut wound, muscle disease, anything. So we are now speaking about lower motor neuron lesion. So as you see, this is lower motor neuron lesion, so it affects both. So all the innervation reaching to the face is damaged. So the patient face, the upper part will be affected and the lower part also will be affected. This is called lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve. As you see here, this part, now the eyebrow is flat, wrinkles are flat, lesion liberal fold is lost, the mouse is, cannot uh, move. On the other side, there is angle of the mouse preserved, lesion liberal fold preserved, we can elevate the eyebrow, everything. So, this affection in this case is called right facial lower motor neuron lesion. It means the uh, right part of the face like this. So to summarize, upper motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve will lead to like this. The lower part of the face is the only affected of the contralateral side of the lesion. But lo lower motor neuron lower motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve, the whole part of the face, upper and lower, will be affected, and the lesion is in the same side of the facial affection. Okay? So this is a very important difference between upper motor neuron lesion and lower motor neuron lesion. Here, I'd like to illustrate for you, if uh, we have a hemiplegia and facial palsy, okay? As you see here, uh, this patient has hemiplegia on the right side, and also the facial is affected in this side of the face. This lesion is called upper motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve. Right, upper motor neuron lesion of the right facial nerve, and there is hemiplegia in this right, in this right side. So the lesion of the facial nerve and the lesion of the uh, body is in the same side. So where is the lesion? The lesion will be here in the internal capsule of the contralateral side. 
Okay. So lesion in the internal capsule here will lead to hemiplegia on the contralateral side and upper motor neuron lesion in the contralateral side of the affection of the internal capsule. On the opposite side, if I have patient with hemiplegia like this, same like this person in the right side of the body, he has right hemiplegia, and I check the facial nerve, I found that the facial nerve is lower motor neuron lesion. So now the facial affection is in the opposite side of the body affection. The body affection on one side and the facial nerve affection on the other side. This is called crossed hemiplegia. This is called crossed hemiplegia. In crossed hemiplegia, it means that the lesion is in the brain stem. Lesion in the brain stem. So that in brain stem, to affect the facial nucleus, producing the slower motor neuron facial, and at the same time, the pyramidal tract will be involved, which will make decussation in the medulla down, reaching to the contralateral side of the, of the body. So keep in your mind this. Facial nerve affection is with the same side of the body affection. The facial nerve will carry the pattern of upper motor neuron lesion. So the lesion here in the internal capsule of the contralateral side of the body. But if the patient with hemiplegia and there is facial nerve affection on the opposite side of the face, which is called crossed hemiplegia, okay? Uh, so crossed hemiplegia, the facial nerve affection will be in the opposite side of the body affection and it will be in the form of lower motor neuron lesion facial nerve. So the lesion here is in the brain stem, in the contralateral side of the body, okay? What is the causes of facial nerve palsy? Cause of facial nerve palsy, either extracranial or intracranial. Extracranial, which is most commonly and the most majority of the case, is idiopathic. And there is a theory that it's a viral infection, either the herpes simplex virus, it's called Bell's palsy, or herpes zoster virus. And it's very important to check the external auditory meters of the same side of the facial affection to check the vesicles of the herpes zoster virus. So it's very important to check the external auditory meatus of the ear of the same side of the affection of the face to rule out ramsey hunt syndrome, which is the vesicles of the herpes zoster virus. Also, any trauma or affection of the face or parotid gland or trauma or surgery or something like this may lead to the lower motor neuron fish. This is the extracranial cause. Regarding the intracranial cause, because as I mentioned to you, the facial nerve, lower motor facial nerve palsy is started from the nucleus down. So you uh, cannot guarantee that maybe the facial nucleus itself affected or the tract after the facial nucleus down in his pathway is affected. So you have to search all these tracts. So it's very important to check if there is any affection in the bones, like MS, like stroke. And as you mentioned before, if there is a stroke in the bones, it will be upper motor neuron lesion. And the hemiplegia will be in the opposite side of the facial affections, called crossed hemiplegia. Other cause intracranial, like cerebellopontine angle tumor. Cerebellopontine angle tumor is a uh, angle between the. Uh, if you, if you, sorry, we make like this. Midbrain, his bones, his medulla, also midbrain, bones, medulla. Here is his angle. This angle between the bones and also the cerebellum is here. This is why it's a small angle, cerebellum montane angle. Affection of this angle, angle uh, will manifest uh, by uh, affection of some collection of cranial nerves. start from five, six, seven, eight, which is located in the bones here, as we mentioned before, five, six, seven, eight, plus cerebellum. So you may, you may have cerebellum affection, plus five, plus six, plus five and six, five and six and seven and eight, plus cerebellum. So uh, the lesion will be in one or two or three or four from this collection. Cerebellum, plus five, plus six, plus seven, plus eight, this is called cerebellum of time angle tumor. And the most common tumor here is the acoustic neuroma. Also, intracranial cause if the auditory canal affection and it uh, will be affect the vestibulocochlear nerve as well. 
all vasculitis like mononeuritis multiples. So to summarize, extracranial cause, idiopathic viral, pills palsy, herpes simplex virus, or herpes zoster virus, or any trauma of the pills and link. Intracranial causes may be stroke, MS, specific lesion, vasculitis, as we mentioned here before. Okay, regarding, uh, can, is, can we have a bilateral facial pulse and facial nerve, lower motor neuron affection in one side and also lower motor neuron affection in the other side? Maybe, maybe. In, the, in some cases, like if it is bilateral Bell's palsy, which is rare, but might be having, or some uh, systemic diseases like sarcoidosis. In sarcoidosis, there will be infiltration of the parotid glands and the parotid gland will be enlarged. Also, in case of mumbus, infection of the parotid. So the parotid gland will be affected bilaterally, so it will affect the facial nerve because the facial nerve running through the parotid gland before it exits to the face. Also, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, because it's uh, demyelination of the peripheral nerve, it can affect the facial nerve in two sides. Myasthenia gravis, which is a, a problem in the neuromuscular junction. As you mentioned before, anything from the nucleus down, nucleus, the nerve, the muscle, the neuromuscular junction, all this is considered lower motor neuron region. And lastly, the Lyme disease, which is related to the ticks uh, insect. So this is a cold of bilateral facial nerve palsy. What will be the investigations to be done in facial nerve palsy? We need to do MRI, brain and the brain stem. We need to check exclude diabetes, uh, ESR and CRB for the vasculitis. Serum uh, angiotensin converting enzyme for sarcoidosis, lion serology for the lion, HIV for the HIV, neuro uh, nerve conduction study in case of Guillain Barry syndrome, lumbar puncture um, to exclude or to check for uh, mononeuritis multiples. Uh, what is the treatment of the facial nerve palsy? Uh, firstly, we have to care about the eye, eye protection, because the eye will be open, we cannot close the eye uh, uh, probably and it may be liable to suffer uh, from corneal ulceration or corneal abrasion. We have to protect the eye by artificial tears, artificial ointment, and the cover by eye bed, especially at night. And consider giving a uh, bread 60 to 80 milligram orally once daily for five days. Better to be started within 72 hours, the onset of the Bill's palsy, uh, plus or minus a cyclovir. And as we know, the Bill's palsy is mostly a self-limiting uh, Disease. But we need to protect the eye, support by prednisolone, and some author recommend giving acylcholine. Shifting to the next, the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is responsible for the hearing and balance. Uh, for hearing, we uh, need to check firstly the external auditory canal by otoscope uh, to check the auditory canal and the tympanic membrane, which is out the scope of the exam. Then uh, we need to uh, checking the hearing. The hearing, simply, you can ask the patient frankly, can you hear me? He will say yes, but you cannot identify if he can hear you by one ear or by two ear, or if the hearing is uh, intact or impaired. So you can do a movement like this, rubbing of your finger near this ear and then near the other ear, and ask him, can you hear me, or can you hear this or not, okay? All some authors said that you can speak uh, with, uh, nearer to him by a faint uh, or uh, weak voice and check if he can understand you or uh, count the number that you tell him this number or not, here and here. Uh, keeping in consideration when you, we speak to this eye, try to close the other, when you speak to this ear, close the other ear, and when you close to, when you speak to this ear, close the other ear either by yourself or better to ask the patient to close uh, his ear by himself by brace on the tragus, his tragus, the patient tragus, okay? The other method or the third method is using the tuning fork, the tuning fork. The tuning fork used here in the hearing, it has high frequencies and the tuning fork uh, used in checking the vibration sense in the lower limb or upper limb. Lower limb, upper limb, to upper limb we use the uh, 128, but here we are using the double A, 256 or 512 hertz, okay? Uh, making a general rule that the air conduction is better than bone conduction. Air conduction is better than bone conduction. 
uh, if the patient cannot hear the sound in one ear, so the next step we will do the test. We have two tests. We have Weber test and Rene test to identify if you are dealing with sensory neural hearing, hearing loss or conductive hearing loss. Uh, if the patient cannot hear he by two uh, by two ears, it would be difficult for us to use the hearing, uh, the paper test and the RNA test. Okay, so if the patient has impaired hearing, we in one ear we will shift to use the paper test, then the uh, RNA test. What is the principle of these tests? Firstly, to remind you, the air conduction is better than bone conduction. What is Weber test? Weber test simply that you are putting a tuning fork in the middle of the uh, patient forehead after making it to vibrate. So vibrating tuning fork and put it in the middle of the uh, now you are using the bone conduction. You are asking the patient if the transmission of the vibration to this ear and to this, to this ear. So, are you hearing in both ears the same? Normally, it will be equally transmitted and they will be equally feel the vibration in both ears. This is normal. But if he said to you, no, I hear in one ear louder than the other ear. So, you put the tuning fork here and he said to you, I hear here louder. Than the other. So if you hear here louder, you have two options. You have two options. This ear with a louder hearing, maybe he has conductive hearing loss here, conductive hearing loss in this ear, so that he can see magnified vibration, or the other ear has a sensory neural hearing loss. Okay? So placing vibration, vibrating tuning fork in the middle of the patient forehead, if you can hear equally, this is normal. If he louder here, so either conductive hearing loss in this ear or sensory neural hearing loss in the opposite ear, then you can shift yourself to the RNA test. What is RNA test? Again, to remind you, the air conduction is better than bone conduction. You will use the tuning fork, putting it in the mastoid process, behind the ear, after making it vibrating, and put it behind. The ear. And ask the patient, do you feel the vibration? He will say yes, okay. When you stop feeling the vibration, let me know. When he say, I stop now, he uh, feels the vibration, shift the tuning fork in front of your ear. And ask him again, still, are you still can hear the tuning fork, provided that you are not making it a vibration again. So you are keep the same vibration. With the same vibration, putting in mastoid, and after that, when the patient said he cannot Feel the vibration more, shift the tuning fork in front of his ear and ask him again, did you still can be able to hear the uh, vibration again? If he is normal, he should, he should still can hear again because this is bone conduction, this is air conduction, the air conduction is better. So he means that he will be able to still hear the vibration by air rather than the uh, bone conduction. So this will be uh, a normal, uh, or it can be called positive RNA test. Positive RNA test, it's called the normal. But we don't prefer to use the term positive RNA because we make confusion. So it is a normal. On the other side, uh, if after finishing the vibration, do you shift here? He said, no, I cannot hear more. So it means that his bone conduction is better than the air conduction, which is matching with the conductive hearing loss and which is, is uh, opposite to the normal because the normal as I mentioned to you before the air conduction is better than bone conduction. In this case it's called negative RNA test or abnormal test but we do not prefer to use the term negative RNA test. I hope that is clear for you the difference between Weber and RNA test. Let's see the picture here. This is the Weber test as I told you putting the uh, tuning fork in the middle and ask if the vibration is equally or no. This is the RNA test, making the vibrating tunic fork in the mastoid firstly, and after he stopped the, uh, feeling the vibration, shift the tunic fork in front of his ear. Now we can shift to what is the causes of 
uh, sensory neural hearing growth. Definitely cause of conductive hearing growth, conduction problem, any air wax, any tympanic membrane rupture, any problem in the ear ossicles. Okay, what is the cause of sensory neural hearing growth? Uh, we have either unilateral sensory neural or bilateral. In unilateral, so it's affecting maybe the cerebral time angle as we mentioned before. So we have four nerves, five, six, seven, eight plus cerebellum. Not mandatory, all will be affected, but will be some sort of this is affected. Five, six, seven, eight plus cerebellum. This is unilateral sensory neural hearing loss. Bilateral sensory neural hearing loss. So it means there is systemic affection, systemic disease, systemic problem, like uh, degenerative changes, especially in the elderly age. It's called pis, uh, prespicuses, okay? Or drugs, especially uh, like uh, giving high dose of diuretic exhibition feel tinnitus, or giving some uh, autotoxic medication like amino glycosides or amphotericine. Uh, so be careful while I'm giving uh, Lasix, uh, because high dose of Lasix or shots of Lasix, the patient may suffer tinnitus, and this is due to sensory neural uh, hearing loss. And definitely, it will be a uh, uh, drug uh, related, and after stopping the drug, might return to the normal again, or maybe infection, especially the mumbus or obel. Now, shifting to the next cranial nerve, which is the uh, ninth and uh, 10th cranial nerve, glossopharyngeal and vagus. What about glossopharyngeal and vagus? We are putting both in the uh, one group. Uh, how to examine this? We are checking the soft ballet. Soft ballet and uvula open the mouth of the patient by light torch, light torch, and by tongue depressor just to make the view is clear for you. Then ask the patient to say, uh, say, ah, uh, so that. The uvula and the muscle of the soft palate will be elevated, so we can check if the uvula is uh, intact, if there is any deviation, any uh, shifting of the uvula, any soft palate dropped from one side to other side like this. So uh, open the open the mouth of the patient by light and by tongue depressor. As the patient say, ah, check the uvula deviation. Here's the uvula deviation. Uh, it will be like this. If the, this part is weak, so it will be like this. It cannot, it cannot stretch the soft palate up. So this part is weak. This left side is weak. So the uvula is deviated to the right side. Okay? So the uvula is deviated away from the side of the lesion is here. The lesion is here in the left side weakness, but the uvula is deviated to the right side. It is uh, similar like facial pulse when you see the angle of the mouse. Angle of the mouse, as I mentioned to you, I have facial pulse here. Angle of the mouse here. This is first impression you feel that this problem here. No, but because this is intact muscle, so move here, so appear here is flat. So the weakness is here. The facial pulse is here in the left side. Same also in the uvula. If there is weakness here, this drop like this, and the uvula directed to the uh, opposite side. Also, you can ask the, I'd like to do gag reflex. I'd like to do, it is not preferable also to do this in the exam and outside the scope exam. But in real life, you can do this in case you see a patient in uh, emergency, suspected stroke, you want to check the bulbar symptom, you want to check gag reflex is intact or no. The gag reflex is carried by afferent is nine and efferent is 10. This is gag reflex. How you do gag reflex? As I mentioned, it's outside the scope of uh, practical exam, like PACES or OSCE. Uh, but if you would like to know, you ask the patient to open the mouth by light touch, light uh, source, and by tongue depressor, uh, make the tongue is down, and you're trying to touch the posterior pharynx. Normally, it will be irritant, and if the patient is anxious, and not, it will be uh, irritant, but uh, if it's exaggerated more, it's called exaggerated gag reflex. And this is matching with the upper motor neuron lesion in the pseudo-bulbar pulse. But if you touch and there is no response at all, no response at all, so it's called lost gag reflex, which is uh, occur in the lower motor and neuron lesion in the bulbar uh, affection. So exaggerated matching with the pseudo-bulbar and loss matching with the bulbar affection. Then you can assess the cuff, ask the patient to cuff, to see if there is any bovine cuff or no. 
ask the patient the swallowing, any regurgitation, any nasal regurgitation, any shocking while swallowing by water swallow test. Uh, all this to check the function of the bulbar symptom. And lastly, to be assisted by the salt. Salt is not the salt in the food, but salt is the speech and language syrups. Speech and language syrups to assess this and also to treat uh, him later in the form for the dysarthria and uh, this articulation. This is the uh, uh, salt speech and language syrups. Let's shift to the next cranial nerve is the uh, accessory, the 11, number 11. There's two muscles. We have two muscles, trapezius and sternocleidomastoid. Uh, the, how to check this? Trapezius is uh, asking the patient to, like this, to shrug the shoulder, keeping the shoulder like this, and you are trying to push down. So the, the patient trying to make like this, and you are pushing down, and there is a See the, how is the strength of the of the patient to elevate the shoulder against your resistance. This is checking the trapezius, the right side and the left side. Any weakness in one or both, like this. And the sternocleidomastoid, you know, sternocleidomastoid from the sternum and from cleido to the mastoid process. Sternocleidomastoid uh, responsible for the turning of the uh, face to one side. So this is sternocleidomastoid making the face directed to that side. So you are putting your hand here and feel the muscle here. So feeling this muscle and ask the patient to move like this and you are resisting like this. And the other side also touch the muscle here and ask the patient to move like this and you are resisting uh, like this. This is sternocleidomastoid. As appear here in the picture, like this trapezius, you put the shoulder and you resist from above. And here ask the patient to uh, Look for look to the to the to, to one side, and you are feeling the muscle here in the in the uh, uh, same side like this as I mentioned to you. So you are feeling the muscle here, and ask the patient to move and open the side. So feel the side and push to the other side. Here also the same mixture. He is a trapezius, and he is a sternocleidomastoid. This is more obvious. She feels a muscle here on one side and put her hand here to resist the patient to move movement of her face to the opposite side. This is a sternocleidomastoid. Lastly is a hypoglossal nerve, which is a 12 cranial nerve. Here's a tongue. You are checking the tongue in three stages. What is this three stages inside the tongue? And ask the patient to protrude the tongue and check the power of the tongue. How we can we do this? Inside, open the mouth and see the tongue. Any wasting, any tremors, any fasciculations. All this matches with the lower motor neuron issue. So I check the tongue while it's inside the mouth. Then ask the patient to protrude the tongue outside. When the patient protrudes the tongue, the tongue is two halves. The muscle is like this. Okay. So the right, the right side is pushing like this and left side pushing like this. They are equal. So the tongue is protruded like straight like this. Okay. Um, when there is paralysis, paralysis of one side, so the tongue will be go like this, deviated to the same uh, side of the paralysis. So because the tongue muscle like this, so if I have paralysis in this in this side, so it will be move like this in the same side of paralysis, it will be deviated to the same side of paralysis of the tongue. Okay. Uh, then after that, you checking the power of the tongue, but instead of touch. Tongue by yourself, you ask the patient to move his tongue through the buccal mucosa, and you are putting your fingers and resisting and shaking the bar through the buccal cavity. Ask the patient to push like this and push like this. So here the tongue is inside, and you are shaking the fasciculation and tremors and wasting. Then ask to protrude any deviation of the tongue or not. If weakness in this side, so the deviation will be in this side. If weakness in this side, the deviation will be in this side. And lastly, checking the tongue through the buccal mucosa of the patient. Uh, kindly note that the tongue is like the face and the palate. Okay, there is bilateral upper motor neuron innervation. So when there is unilateral upper motor neuron affection, it will not cause any deviation. So unilateral upper motor neuron will not cause any problem in the, uh, in, the, in, the in the tongue, but in the bilateral upper motor neuron region will affect the 
uh, uh, crane nerve number 9, 10, and 12, and this is called pseudo bulbar bots, which result in stiff tongue. Remember that pseudo bulbar is upper motor with stiff tongue. Stiff tongue, pseudo bulbar borsi, and this is with the upper motor neuron lesion. While in the lower motor neuron lesion, there will be a circulation, wasting, tremors, like this. And if this is unilateral lower motor neuron, the tongue will be deviated towards the weaker side. As I mentioned too, this is a weaker, weaker side. This so the stronger side will push like this. So the tongue will be deviated to the weaker side. If this is the weaker, the tongue will be deviated to the weaker side in the lower motor neuron region. And if this bilateral lower motor neuron region, you will find this uh, At the end of the cranial nerve examination, now we finish the 12 cranial nerve examination. It seems it, it is a long process, but actually if you uh, try to practice this, it will not be too much hard. And I'd like to advise you, you have to practice. Yeah, what we are discussing here is just the academic principle and the, uh, the basic knowledge. Uh, but uh, this is uh, not uh, a replacement of uh, practicing and uh, going to the clinical uh, course and the clinical round and see the vision by yourself and adjust the time to examine the cranial nerves and to know the steps exactly and what are you what are you looking for. After you finish the 12 cranial nerve examination, you have to thank the patient and hand sterilization. And after that, put in your mind to check the following. If you have hemiplegia, you have to check the heart. If you have hemiplegia with a cranial nerve affection, either crossed or uncrossed, you have to check the heart. Heart, checking the heart by auscultation of the heart, by checking the pulse, and by checking the carotid. Okay, so heart auscultation, pulse, if there is AF or arrhythmia, and carotid if there is any carotid bruit. And ask the examiner, I'd like to complete my examination by checking the following speech and gait. It's very important to ask the patient to speech, to know what is the type of speech, not my speech, cat speech, dead speech, like this. Everything is a clue for something, uh, like monotonous uh, speech and uh, uh, with Parkinson, uh, staccato speech, slurring speech, like this. Gait is very important to check the gait of the patient. After the patient, please, I'd like to check your gait. Uh, then, if it is needed to check the upper limbs examination, lower limb examination in the sensory and the motor affection, check the cerebellar affection, and finally to know the handwriting of the patient is he, is the patient is hand right uh, right handed or left handed because by this you can know which uh, hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere. All of us mostly right handed, so the dom our dominant hemisphere is the left hemisphere. Okay. Uh, There is a, a video uh, illustrating the cranial nerve examination. I will send uh, the link for you, and I highly recommend this channel. It's a very good uh, channel for clinical examinations called uh, Geeky Medics. You'll find it in, at YouTube, uh, Greek Medics, and also another reference, another recommendation. Uh, the channel of Osmosis is a very good uh, channel. You can see uh, the official nerve policy by uh, all details and all the course of the official nerve and the lesions. A very fantastic and very impressive channel. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank you for your attendance and for this uh, lecture. I hope that it will be good uh, for you and I hope that. I can simplify the issues. Uh, I will be uh, very pleased if you want to ask me further questions or any concerns. You can contact me through the WhatsApp appear on the slide or by, uh, by email or by email or by WhatsApp. Uh, finally, uh, thank you and meet you, hoping to meet you in another session. Thank you.